Welcome to Philosophy and Critical Thinking, The Basics. In today's video, we're going to be discussing Two Theories of Justice by John Rawls and Robert Nozick. In philosophy, when we're discussing justice, we're asking the question, what makes a just society? And one of those questions can involve how should we divvy up the goods? How should we spread uh, all the goods in society uh, to make it a just society? And this is called distributive justice. First, we're going to be discussing John Rawls' theory of distributive justice. His theory is justice as fairness. What would be uh, the most fair thing to do would be the just thing to do. And he does this by applying three different theories. One is the difference principle, the other is the original position, and the other is the veil of ignorance. The difference principle is to give most of the goods to the people who are the worst off, and to give the least amount of the goods to those who are the best off. Uh, imagine a pizza and the pizza hasn't been cut evenly. You've got you know, a couple of big slices and a few small slices. Um, we, you would give the smaller slices to the people who aren't very hungry. Let's say they've eaten something before and they feel quite full. And then um, you'd give the big slices to the people who are really hungry, who may have skipped lunch or so, so on. So that's an idea of the difference principle. If you want a more economic idea of a difference principle, it would be similar to a progressive tax system where if you have a high income, you'll be paying more of your percentage in tax. Whereas um, if you have a low income, you'll, have, you'll, uh, you'll pay a lower percentage of tax as opposed to a flat tax system where, say, everybody pays 30%. So this would be examples of the difference principle. Rawls wants us to apply the difference principle from what is called the original position. This is a thought experiment where you can create a society however you want. So you're going to start a new society um, and you can design it however you want. So you're going to decide how the goods are going to be divvied up in this society. Um, we'll get to in a second why he says the difference principle will be applied there, but this is where he wants to apply it. He doesn't want to say try and do it right now. Imagine a world where you've going to set up this society and you can structure it however you want, and that's the original position. The veil of ignorance is a little rule that you have in the original position, is that the catch is you cannot know who you're going to be in that society. So how, when you decide how you're going to divvy up the goods in that society, you don't know what position you're going to be in. So, for example, let's say you're going to set it up in a way where there would be um, slaves and slave owners. You wouldn't know if you in that world whether you'd be the slave owner or you'd be the slave. That's That's what's going to happen. So you don't know what part of society you're going to be in. So the way Rawls thinks about this is he allows you to be completely selfish here. You can think just purely in your own personal self-interests, how are you going to divvy up all the goods um, from this veil of ignorance, from this position where you don't know what part of that society you're going to be in. And that's why he says the rational choice would be the difference principle, because if you set it up in a way, if you're one of the people who are the best off, you've uh, got all the, you know, good luck, all the life chances have gone your way, and you don't, and you get the least amount of the goods in society, then you're doing okay because you're already in a good position. Whereas if you end up really unlucky in the bad position, um, or the uh, goods, or lots of the goods in society are going to go your way, and so you'll end up all right. If someone was say wanted to gamble a little bit here, and say you know what I'm I'm gonna try my chances here. I'm gonna put all my um, all the goods in this one particular area and just hope that I end up in that 
area, he says, well, you can try that if you like, but that's not rational. That's just, you know, being a high stakes gambler. So we'd say we won't be rational people. And um, the rational choice would be to apply the difference principle. Now moving on to Robert Nozick, he holds four principles here. One is justice as entitlement. This is also known as libertarianism. The next principle is Kantian categorical imperative, which we covered in our ethics tutorial. The next is taxation as forced labor or as slavery. And the fourth principle is the right to legitimately attained property. Nozick's libertarianism is the view that the state has no right to use taxes for the use of helping others, only services for protecting property rights. That would be things like the police and the military. It's okay to use taxes for things like that, but you can't use taxes um, for just to help people out who um, are having it tough. So, for instance, um, things like welfare. Um, he said you can you can do you can use your own money for charity. You could you know you could give some of your money away uh, for those people and help them out um, over your own wishes and 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 do it that way. But the state can't uh, force you to do it by through taxation. They can't use the uh, taxes to go to those ends. Uh, he takes that from the Kantian principle of treating people as ends in themselves and not as a means to an end. You can't um, treat people in a certain way just so you can get some kind of other outcome out of it. You've got to um, treat people as ends in themselves. That's the Kant Kantian principle there. So that's where he grounds his justification in saying you can't use taxes to help other people. The reason Nozick saw that the taxation to help others was a violation of that Kantian categorical imperative of treating people as a means as, as opposed to an end in themselves is that he saw the taxation as a form of forced labour. Because since you have to pay your taxes, you can't choose not to pay your taxes. The government makes you do it and you can get into a lot of trouble. You can even go to jail for evading your taxes. That you're being forced to work some of your hours for free. So you're, you're going to your work and you're doing your work and you're earning that money. But you're being forced to give that money um, back to the government. And since the government's using some of that taxation money towards um, other people, that this is, it's forcing you to give that money to somebody else. And, and that's where he's seeing that as a violation and sees that as a form of slavery. So that's where he um, justifies his view as taxation as a form of forced labour. Regarding property rights, Robert Nozick uses a thought experiment to try and demonstrate how if you uh, get your money uh, legitimately, either through somebody giving it to you or um, through some kind of transaction or finding something which has not been previously owned by anybody else. So if you've been able to uh, get that property or get that income or that wealth legitimately um, then that's yours that's your property and uh, you can do that with that property what you wish um, that's yours and no one can force forcefully take it away from you through taxation or otherwise so he uses this thought experiment using a um, old um, basketball player called Wilt Chamberlain at his time Wilt Chamberlain was a very popular basketball player and in this thought experiment, Wilt Chamberlain demands from all of the spectators on the games that he'll play in is that there'll be a box with his name on it uh, next to the admission stand. And when the, uh, the, the spectators buy their ticket, they also have to put 25 cents into the, into the box. And um, yeah, unless unless those rules are applied, Wilt Chamberlain says he's not going to play. Um, he'll only play if that under those conditions. So 
He's a very good basketball player and everyone enjoys watching him play, so all the spectators are more than happy with that. They're more than happy to pay the admission, plus put the 25 cents into the into the box. So at this stage, Wilt Chamberlain is getting paid the same amount of money as all the other players with the salary, but then at the end of the game, he collects all that money from the box and keeps that to himself as the extra part there. What Nozick says from this sort of experiment is that he is entitled to that money because um, everyone who paid 25 cents was willing to do so. They weren't forced to. They could have easily said, you know, oh, you know, this Will Chamberlain sounds a bit up himself. I'm not going to watch the game with him. And that, no, they were, they were more than happy to go by those conditions. And um, all the other players are still getting the same money as they were getting before through the salary. It's just Will Chamberlain has set this up, you know, to get more money for himself. And everyone's agreed to the conditions. So he is entitled to that money. There's no obligation on him to share that money with anybody else. If you want more information, you can go onto the website www.philosophycriticalthinking.com or you can click onto the Amazon links here for uh, uh, two books regarding Robert Nozick's Theory of Entitlement which, and also John Rawls's book um, on his Theory of, of Justice as Fairness. So if you want those, you can click onto those links. In our next video, instead of talking about what makes a just society regarding distributing the goods, we're going to talk about punishment. Uh, how should a, um, a just society punish its uh, citizens that commit crimes? Uh, if you want to stay in tune for that, please subscribe and click the bell.